Hi, everyone, and welcome to our new live webcast, Smart Factories Redefine Security Paradigms. My name is Daniela Previtali, the Global Marketing Director for Vibu Systems, and I am delighted you are here with us today. We are joined by Richard Mark Soli, Executive Director of the Industrial Internet Consortium, and Oliver Vincent Reed, CEO and founder of Vibu Systems. The Industrial Internet Consortium is a global not-for-profit partnership of industries, government and academia that is set in the architectural framework and direction for the industrial internet. Vibu Systems is a global leader in software protection, license lifecycle management and cybersecurity solutions against piracy, counterfeiting, reverse engineering and tampering. Today, our hosts are going to talk about how the role of security has changed over time, with a special emphasis on the consequences, the challenges and the necessary guidelines for the industrial sector. Some housekeeping we need to take care of before we start. For everyone who's joining us today, I want to remind you that we will be reserving some time at the end of the sessions for Q&A, and I'd like to invite you to submit any question you have in the live chat room. This session is being recorded and a link to the replay will be posted directly to you in a couple of days. Without further ado, I'll pass things to, over to Oliver. The floor is yours. Yeah, hello everybody. Welcome to our webinar. And Daniela, thank you for the introduction. So um, let's uh, start with uh, what uh, smart factories, uh, what is special with that or what are the benefits we are looking forward? Why it's a evolution or revolution in manufacturing? So I want to go to in total 15 points with some uh, things you can think about it. So one advantage, one goal is predictable productivity. So that means uh, flexible production is will become the standard, not production optimized for one single product, but uh, having this flexibility always. Um, next step is predictive maintenance. So, automizing procurement, automizing spare part replacement, quality controls beyond simple scheduling and uh, integrating intelligent uh, machine-driven decisions on this point. Important uh, benefit. Adaptive analytics. So that means, uh, what I understand of that, automatic and exponentially greater analytic skills for big data. Low operating costs. Of course, everybody is uh, looking on lower operating costs, but why can that be reached? So at, in many production floors, we will see fewer personal and we will see optimized processes and optimized energy consumption in total resulting then in lower operating costs. We want to become more friendly to the environment, so a better use of natural resources and assets and less waste. We want to reduce the enterprise risks, so that means the lower total cost of ownership, fewer personal, what, we, what I've told before, infrastructure also distributed among amongst uh, several manufacturers and uh, distributed uh, between uh, different locations as well. So it would be great to get uh, uh, greater convenience for the user. So that means manufacturing of small and customized batches uh, compared to high volume mass production and that should be possible from single items to large scale production runs. We want to see some custom marketing based on real-time data in the production, in the order, in the, in the process. More interactivity, so smart decisions done by machines, influences, influenced by data collected from the process and collected from the user experience, something that is not possible without smart factories. We want to get higher safety standards that uh, safety standards are established already and uh, there are many national uh, regulations in all the countries for that, but they are also the, what we want to reach is that we get independent on personal capabilities, willingness, funds, expertise, but depending on large-scale algorithms. Greater professionalism, that is uh, 
there is a demand in smart factories for professionals with higher qualification and with multidiscipline knowledge. So people, the requirement for the people will become higher and education is certainly one point uh, that is very important for the success of smart factories. Higher efficiency in terms of quality, logistics and production standards. Uh, level playing field, that I mean with that, that the uh, standardization of interfaces, security measures, manufacturing processes, infrastructures for higher model replicability, and distributed access across the globe. So that's things together with interoperability that will become very, very important. Shorter time to market, a benefit everybody sees immediately. That is also um, uh, initiated by the flexibility of industrial IoT devices and the upgradability of features, functions in any kind of devices. If it's a sensor or an actor, it doesn't matter. And of course, new business models. So the a concept similar to the app concept in your smartphone uh, can be realized in all the networked uh, IoT devices in a smart factory. And that uh, allowing uh, for new monetization options and for upgrading features in the future. So that's some of the features, each of them require uh, some work to make that happen. But uh, that's what we think we will see in the future and what are the big benefits. So global smart factory industry activities are all over the world. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's in the US uh, where it's called industrial internet or in Europe where it's called industry 4.0, industry 4.0. Uh, initially driven very much by, by Germany, but uh, today there are many initiatives from the UK, European Commission in many European countries, in France, in Spain, and so on, and in Asia as well. So in China it's called Made in China 2025, but there are also initiatives in Japan, in Korea, uh, working a lot on that, and it's important that here a good cooperation is uh, um, at the end realized to, to push that. And I'm sure that Richard will uh, say something about cooperation and the recently uh, announced things in his presentation later. So um, yeah, some of the results or some of intermediate results is uh, international activities uh, with the industrial internet reference architecture, with the security framework, the journal of innovation, uh, what you might know as a result from the German uh, platform Industry 4.0 is the reference architecture, RAMI 4.0, the Industry 4.0 component and the research and development uh, roadmap and the Industry 4.0 component. And in China, um, the goals uh, from the uh, plans of the politics are chain transform China from manufacturing giant to manufacturing power and grow from big to strong and that's something I'm personally quite frequently in China. You can really see there that uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of things happening. Yeah, and uh, one of the challenges, there are many challenges for all that, but one of the global challenges is security. All this um, systems that are increasingly connected require security, require an identity, and we will see about, we will see more about that later, um, besides uh, the challenges about safety, privacy, and so on, product protection. So let me hand over to Richard now at this point of time. Thank you very much so far, and I will come back to you later. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to join you on this call and to talk a little bit about the Industrial Internet Consortium, which is a, a worldwide consortium, although our headquarters are in the United States, as, uh, as Oliver mentioned. Uh, we have offices, nine offices in seven countries around the world, so it's actually a very international organization, and I'll talk a little bit about the membership. But I want to start by talking about where these ideas come from and uh, why we call it the industrial internet and, and uh, perhaps where all the different names like industry 4.0 and industry du futur and cyber physical systems and so forth come from. So first, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about history, if I can get the slides to change. 
Uh, sorry for the delay. Yes. So in 1995, um, I, um, I I I saw a wonderful quote from uh, from Bill Gates, the CEO of, uh, of Microsoft. He was asked by a reporter why it was that Microsoft didn't have an internet division. And he, he said, well, what's the point of having an internet division? That would be like having an electricity division. It's in everything we do. I had been reading at that time the history of the adoption of electricity in, in North America and Western Europe. And I knew that between 1900 and 1910, in fact, most large companies did have electricity divisions, divisions that were trying to figure out how to use this new technology to, uh, to, to distribute better, to manufacture better, to build better quality, and so forth. Um, and eventually, they no longer had electricity divisions, or they did, but they called them janitors. They replaced the light bulbs. Um, in uh, 1999, um, Mr. Gates turned around completely, and he and he um, he published a letter to all of his employees, 80,000 employees. And most interesting letter in that um, line in that letter was the line that said, "A fundamental new rule for business is that the internet changes everything." If I could see you, I, I'd ask you, uh, "Do you agree with that?" Almost everyone does. But I think I'm going to be able to convince you that although there have been some major changes in in uh, in the industry. Uh, in many industries. Um, there are probably not as many as you think. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some industries that have been changed tremendously by the Internet. I think the most obvious one is music. Um, those of us with less hair on top of our heads remember these things called um, boom boxes. You see a, a gentleman leaning against one there. Uh, they weren't quite so big, but you could carry them on, on your shoulder. And music was distributed physically on physical media, on 8-track tapes, on cassette tapes, on records of varying sizes with, uh, with uh, typical names for those sizes being numbers. But today, music is delivered entirely virtually. It's delivered over the Internet, and, and it's played uh, from MP3s um, or, or, uh, or other formats through computers. Those computers don't necessarily look like a laptop, like in this picture in the upper right, um, but they are computers, whether they are your mobile telephone or whether they're music players or whether they're music, large music players connected to your stereo system at home. We've seen the same transitions happen to watching movies. Um, I, I've just discovered that my adult children have probably never seen anything over the air on television. Um, they only watch things uh, that come off the Internet, legally, of course. Um, they have a television, but... Uh, they uh, they use that television to connect to the internet and watch things off of YouTube. The way we contact people with Skype and Facebook, um, the way we read the news even, um, there, there's a dwindling number of people reading the news in newspapers. They don't like to get the ink on their fingers. When you read news on the internet, you don't get ink on your fingers. So yes, in the entertainment businesses, in, 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 uh, in music business, in, uh, in the, the book business and so forth, there have been enormous changes. Um, but I hope I can convince you that there are some interesting industries in which there have not been major changes engendered by the Internet. Here's one that I actually worked in myself. Um, some of you will recognize this if you're in the manufacturing space or you, you've heard of programmable logic controllers or PLCs. That's a picture of a box that I worked with personally from 1979 to 1980. It was made by a company that was then called Monocon, later called Gould, now called Schneider. Uh, it's a French company with a German name in the United States. That box is used for um, it's uh, used for managing uh, what are called discrete manufacturing lines. So those are some of the most common factories in the world. Things that uh, that make these are factories that make things step by step: shave a corner off the titanium block, drill a hole in it, sand out the one end, and so forth. As it moves down the factory line. Different things are done to the uh, to to the, the with, by with different tools to things that are moving down the line. That particular box was being used in a factory making brake linings for automobiles. Um, the uh, the company was General Motors. Um, they were very good to us. We called them Generous Motors. Um, and um, uh, they, that's a company you probably heard of uh, uh, making cars in the Detroit area. There were some interesting things about this computer, and it really was a computer. Inside that box was a Motorola 68000 chip to be found in many, many, many microcomputers and mini computers of that era. But it, it, people didn't think of it as a computer. In fact, the way you programmed that was that strange language to the right of the photograph. That's called ladder logic or ladder diagrams. Um, and it was basically step by step what you do as you move down uh, the ladder, what you move as you move down the manufacturing line. 
um, check for, uh, for example, there are switches there and check that uh, there's nobody inside the manufacturing area because a drill is about to come out and it would kill somebody if they happen to walk in at the wrong moment. So there's a safety switch and then the drill comes out, drills a hole in the block and so forth. Um, I think more interesting than the fact that they were programmed in very different ways than other computers at the time is that it wasn't connected to the other computers at the time. That is, if you wanted to take information about the manufacturing line, for example, to, to, to be uh, used for just-in-time delivery of inputs from your suppliers or just-in-time uh, outputs to your customers, um, you actually had to print out information from that box um, and then walk across the floor to the information systems. This is the operational system. And in, in the information systems, type it back in. We we'll call it sneaker net uh, that is carried by a human being. Not very efficient and in fact loaded with errors. There, there were factories where you would see 40 and 50 percent error rates in, in the material that was moved from operational systems to information systems. Here's the strangest thing. If we move forward to, uh, to 2016, um, the box looks pretty different. Uh, it's blue now instead of tan. Um, it's uh, got a lot more plastic parts than it used to. Um, it's still programmed the same way, strangely enough. Um, uh, the, the number has changed. It's no longer a Modicon 584. It's called a Schneider 984. Um, but I think the most dangerous thing about it is it's still not connected with the information systems in the plant. We don't call them manufacturing resource planning systems anymore. We call them enterprise resource planning systems, but they do the same thing. They manage your just-in-time. They manage your, uh, your use of the factory floor. They manage all sorts of things that would, you'd get tremendous value out of if you could connect the operational systems with the information systems. But what's been lacking is internet thinking. That is, these boxes have worked the same way for decades and nobody wants to change them and they haven't really thought about how the internet can change that market. That's really important and we see that in lots of other markets as well. Um, in the electric grid market, in oil and gas exploration, in jet engines, uh, in uh, electric, uh, electric grid transmission, as I said, and in rail and transportation, smart homes, and on and on and on. As Oliver mentioned, it's called different things in different countries. In the U.S., it's actually typically called cyber-physical systems. Japan, it's called the Internet Value Chain Initiative. But China has recently changed the name from Internet Plus to, uh, 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 to, the, to their 2025 effort. The point is, as Oliver says, it doesn't really matter what you call it. There is a pattern here, which is take information from a large number of sensors, potentially millions of sensors, make real-time decisions, predictive analytics decisions based on benchmark data, information that you've seen before about your oil and gas exploration, about your jet engine performance, uh, about your uh, discrete manufacturing line, and so forth, and either deliver that information in visualization to uh, decision makers to make intelli more intelligent decisions or actually have impact directly on actuators in the real world. For example, in the transportation space, know that uh, two rail cars are about to hit each other and move one out of the way. Um, something you want to do faster than a human being might be able to do it. That's the pattern that we call the Internet of Things, but applying the Internet of Things to industrial systems. Most people, when they talk about the Internet of Things, don't think about industrial systems, but we think it's critically important because this market has, is essentially untouched. Let me talk about why we call it the industrial internet, why we have a different name. So in the late 19th century, actually from about 1840 to the turn of, this, of that century, there was a revolution in the way machines worked. Um, we called it the industrial revolution. Most people have read about it. Uh, that was the, the movement of human power, human energy, to machine power, typically at the beginning steam and later internal combustion. That industrial revolution led to an enormous leap in productivity, somewhere between two and a half and four times productivity. Obviously there were huge disruptions as well. Uh, here in Germany where I am at the moment there was a, a, um, a, a movement called the Webers. Um, these were people that went around destroying looms, these automated looms, because they were destroying jobs. Um, the same thing happened in England. There they were called Luddites. But the point is, at the end of that enormous transition, that disruption from 1840 to, uh, to the well, mid-20th century, really, uh, many more jobs were created than lost. Certainly some of them were to, to build and maintain these new automated looms. But just as importantly, the enormous leap in productivity created an enormous leap in consumer demand, which created an enormous leap in available jobs. So there was disruption and the new jobs were very different than the old jobs. 
We saw this happen again in the late 20th century with the Internet Revolution, but it, but highly accelerated. The Internet uh, Revolution and the Information Revolution that came with it moved human connectivity to machine connectivity. And again, we saw a huge leap in productivity. And again, we saw a disruption. So we're seeing the loss of newspapers, of uh, bookstores, uh, and, and uh, what we think of as uh, the, the bricks and, and mortar rather than clicks and uh, the clicks of, uh, of the Internet in some industries. Um, but um, that enormous disruption is also creating new jobs, of course. Some of those are new jobs uh, that, that have to do with the new technology. For example, in 1990, there were not many webmasters. There was just one. His name was Tim. Um, there are now many webmasters, millions, maybe even tens of millions of webmasters worldwide for the billions of web pages that exist. And we're seeing this huge leap in productivity, which was damped a little bit at the end of the Internet Revolution, the end of the millennium. We think if you take this Internet Revolution and add it to the Industrial Revolution, you get what we call the Industrial Internet. That is, applying Internet of Things technology, Internet technology in general, to industrial systems. Why do we do? Why are we interested in doing that? Because, as I said, it's an untouched opportunity. Although people are applying the internet technology to entertainment, to, and to sports, and to many other areas, they have not really touched some 46% of the world's gross domestic product, according to Marco Nunziata uh, in his report, the 2012 report of the industrial internet, published by General Electric. Um, Annunciata's work said that something like 46% of world GDP, or at the time 32.3 trillion US dollars, uh, is in industrial systems that have not been touched by the internet. If you look at the numbers from Cisco or Gardner or McKinsey or many other sources, they say pretty much the same thing. Hundreds of billions of US dollars in new opportunity by 2020, operating cost savings and so forth. So how do we get there? How do, obviously, there are some problems that need to be solved. Uh, a lot of them have to do with interoperability and security and privacy and all of the, the problems that you expect to see in the Internet and that we have seen in the Internet in the last 20 years projected into industrial systems. I mean, clearly, we don't want to see the level of security uh, in industrial systems that we have today in most of the Internet. In fact, um, I gave a presentation here in Berlin last year I was interrupted by a guy who said, um, I run a, a factory floor, and if you give me the same level of security uh, um, on my floor as, uh, as, is, as is found on the Internet, I'm a dead man. So we have lots of problems to solve, interoperability and standards being obvious ones. But th the question is, how do we figure out what standards need to be made? How do we figure out where the disruptions are likely to be? How do we figure out where the best use cases, the best examples, to do in, uh, industrial internet solutions, internet solutions on industrial systems. Well, we could hope that the big data suppliers and the major industrial partners, the, the, uh, uh, the mining companies and the manufacturing companies and the process chemical companies uh, and the banks and government agencies and technology vendors and standards organizations would make the right relationships one-on-one -on -one, um, and create this enormous web of opportunity. But the reality is that would take forever, and in some markets it never happens. So our idea is a little bit simpler, and that is bring them together into what we call an ecosystem of organizations, all of those different sorts of companies, large companies and small companies, to create what we call the Industrial Internet Consortium. Again, focused on applying Internet of Things technology to industrial systems, figuring out where the transformational business opportunities are, and then figuring out what standards need to be made and what open source solutions need to be built and what commercial solutions need to appear on the market. We'll bring together the government agencies and the research organizations and the academic organizations and so forth to work together, find those opportunities, and find those solutions. So on March 27, 2014, almost exactly two years ago, five companies, AT&T, Cisco, General Electric, IBM, and Intel, got together and created this agreed mission statement. The important words in that mission statement are the last three words, transformational business outcomes. In essence, these five companies said, at the ch its chief executive level, our markets are going to be disrupted by the introduction of Internet technologies and especially the Internet of Things to what we do. We want to learn what those disruptions are by disrupting ourselves. The best way to figure out what's happening in the future is to, in the best way is to invent the future. So we've created a, we call it a sandbox, where we create test beds 
where we actually try out these ideas, use cases of industrial internet technology on real industrial systems to find the disruptive new opportunities, products and services, and deliver uh, requirements and priorities to standards organizations so that they can solve the holes in interoperability, security, and privacy that need to be solved. So who's participating? Um, there are about 252 companies this morning. Uh, roughly 40% of them are large companies, so these are some of the large companies that are participating. Besides the five founder members, uh, two contributing members have joined us, SAP uh, and Schneider Electric. Um, but you'll also find uh, large users of this technology, companies like Hire that makes uh, dishwashers and, and washing machines, and companies like Toyota that of course makes automobiles, and banks, and I like to mention the one in the upper left-hand corner, Codelco, which is a mining company, the largest copper mining company in the world. Um, why in the world would they be interested in joining this organization like the technology companies? Clearly because they believe that the mining industry is going to be badly disrupted by, uh, by Internet of Things technology, and rather than wait for other organizations to disrupt the market and then be disrupted themselves, they're trying to invent those disruptions by participating in our test beds. Not all ideas come from big companies, however, so about 55% of our members are small companies, um, or as they say here in Germany, Mittelstand, less than $50 million or euros in, in turnover. Um, I, I won't read to you you this list of companies, but suffice it to say that they are technology vendors, they're software vendors, uh, they are um, small manufacturing companies, they are um, research organizations like Fraunhofer, and of course, uh, I should mention that Webu Systems is one of those companies. But it's important also to have the research organizations, the government agencies, and testing organizations participating as well, and about two dozen of our members are those standards organizations, open source projects, testing organizations like Qualical and, and Underwriters Laboratories, national research laboratories like CSIRO in Australia, and universities, the first of which to join was Technische Universität Darmstadt in, in, in Germany. So we bring them together, and we bring them together to do several different things. First, to agree that they want to work together to figure out what these disruptions will be, and by actually disrupting those industries and markets. Then to develop architectural frameworks. Our architecture is called the Industrial Internet Reference Architecture, or IIRA. Um, develop standards requirements, use cases uh, for applying Internet of Things in industrial systems, security frameworks, which we'll be publishing shortly, um, and then use those things to build test beds. We started writing test beds immediately because we think that that's how you learn what you have to do uh, to apply Internet of Things technology to industrial systems. It's very important to work with others that are doing that, um, so I don't have a slide for this, but last week we announced a, a major collaboration with Industry 4.0, or Industry 4.0, as Oliver mentioned. Um, uh, the, uh, the Industry 4.0 project has also developed a reference architecture called RAMI, as he mentioned, uh, and um, there already has been some informal work to, to ensure that we can make those architectures aligned and work together and so that it's possible to build solutions that apply to both of those architectures and we will be announcing more and more uh, uh, cooperative agreements with Industry 4.0 moving forward uh, including um, uh, tomorrow at Bosch Connected World uh, here in Berlin, um, next week at CBIT uh, in Hanover um, and then a, a major uh, dis discussion of collaboration at the Hanover Messe in April and a joint forum on the topic. I just want to tell you about some of the test beds that we developed. Um, last year at Bosch Connected World here in Berlin, Bosch, Tech Mahindra, and Cisco jointly announced uh, our first public test bed. It's called Track and Trace, and it, it's uh, to do uh, no less than reinvent the way manufacturing floors are managed. Uh, by tracking everything on the factory floor, people, parts, work in progress, and tools, it's possible to do a better job of efficiently using the factory floor. You know what's in use when, what's in, what's, what use is going to change, what things are moving through the factory at what speed, so that you can optimize the, the manufacture of a factory, whether it's a, a Bosch factory itself or whether it's one of Bosch's customers, because Bosch Rex, Bosch's uh, Rexroth uh, division, of course, makes tools for other manufacturers as well, including in the aviation business. This has been a tremendously successful test bed. It's already spun off requirements for standards and open source. We'll be announcing more about that um, over the uh, tomorrow and then over the coming weeks. 
Um, and uh, it's moving into a second phase now where they will be doing position, uh, positioning not only um, within about one meter, which is the resolution today of this test bed, but in three millimeters resolution so that you can know not just who's holding what tool and using what work in progress, but which part is going into which hole on a work in progress so that you can make sure that it's also done not only efficiently, but safely. Make sure the tool is being used the right way, is being used when some, by someone trained to use the tool and so forth. Soon after that, we announced the test bed uh, in um, electric grids. Um, we've announced test beds in uh, smart cities in, in, in southern Ireland. We have test beds for asset management uh, and, for, uh, and, and for quality uh, in, in many different topics. And all of our test beds, all of our 13 public test beds are listed on our website as well. And I'll be leaving you with the URL for the, uh, uh, for the website at the end. Obviously, it's critically important to work with standards organizations. Um, there are many different technologies for connecting systems over, over the Internet, the Internet of Things. Um, and they include, for example, the data distribution service of the Object Management Group uh, and uh, the um, OPC uh, standard from OPC Foundation and MQTT from OASIS and so forth. But it's critically important to get the semantic standards right in the smart grid space. That's why we have a relationship with SGIP, as you see on this slide. In the identity and security space, which is a reason for our relationship with GS1, and national and international standards organizations like DIN and AFNOR and uh, ISO and ITU and so forth. The future, I think, is quite bright. Um, we know this because we've built test beds already. There are results from those test beds already, and some of those results are, are astounding. Um, I, we, we are building test beds in many, many different areas, but I think the one that will change the world most importantly, I have emblematic of this photograph on the right side of this slide. For those of you who haven't seen this device, it's called a, um, uh, a pulse oximeter. It looks through your skin and through your um, uh, arterial wall and guesses how much oxygen is in your blood. I say guesses because we have different colors of skin and different uh, thicknesses of arterial walls, and so only about 80% of the readings are correct. That number actually gets worse if, um, if a nurse mistakenly puts the blood pressure cuff on the same arm as the pulse oximeter, and when the blood pressure cuff pump pumps up, um, the oximeter will actually say that you have no oxygen in your blood uh, and report that you are dying. Um, but there will be a false alarm, and most nurses know that that's a false alarm, and they'll ignore one or maybe even two. Um, this is unacceptable because people die from that. Um, obviously, it can be solved if you could connect the pulse oximeter to the, uh, to the blood pressure cuff, but unfortunately, there's no manufacturer that makes both. There are no pulse oximeters and, and, and uh, um, uh, blood pressure cuffs that are, sit on the same network or speak the same protocol, so integration is difficult. That makes no sense in a world where the Internet connects so many devices, um, and the Internet of Things will make it possible to connect even more. So I'll leave you with information on how to find out more from us. Um, that's uh, my direct contact information. The last line is the URL for the, in the Industrial Internet Consortium, iiconsortium.org. There you can find uh, all sorts of information from what our test beds are doing to what our working groups are doing uh, to uh, how to join if you'd like to participate. As you can see, uh, participants include large companies and small companies, companies in about 30 different countries, government agencies, research organizations, universities, and so forth. And with that, I'll hand back to Oliver for the balance of the uh, of the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, for your excellent presentation and uh, the overview of the IIC activities. I think it's uh, uh, in the beginning I thought it's an American uh, initiative, but it's a global initiative, and we have uh, really a great cooperation between companies in the IIC from all over the world. So that's an uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, organization and a good chance also for everybody, small companies, large companies, to participate and uh, to contribute to, uh, to all of us. So let me continue the presentation with some activities where Vivo Systems is involved. So Vivo Systems, uh, Richard mentioned it, we are one of the small and medium-sized or middle uh, members uh, of IIC since about one year. We are working in projects, industrial projects, uh, for many years, and I want to show you some of that, and I want uh, then to discuss a little bit the security requirements and some words about available solutions. So I 
took uh, three samples for smart factory projects where Vivo Systems is involved. So the first one with smart factory KL, uh, the second one uh, with uh, uh, the leading head of a Fraunhofer uh, Gesellschaft, Fraunhofer IOSB, and the last one which started uh, just uh, several months ago in the last year uh, as a large project, uh, German reference project for security in industry 4.0. So let's start with Smart Factory KL. Just uh, for the history, it's um, um, started as an initiative from University of Kaiserslautern and the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, DFKI. And that's already many more than 10 years ago. So nobody has been talking about Industry 4.0 at this point of time. But of course, the internet has been existing already. And so um, it started more than 10 years ago with uh, smart home was initially a little bit uh, first solutions available, but also not very much, launching smart factory in 2005. And you see the industry 4.0 initiative in Germany has been launched in 2011. And during this period of time before 2011, we have seen the internet, we have seen cyber physical systems. And um, then in 2015, smart factory had his has it 10 year anniversary and um, so the picture on the top right is one of the uh, demo um, machines uh, to show this uh, smart factory and industry 4.0 production mechanisms in, in life. So who is uh, contributing and member of the smart factory initiative? So you see German companies and international companies, you have Cisco from the US, you have Huawei from China, you have IBM, and you have uh, German Mittelstand companies uh, like Pils uh, and, and large ones like Bosch Rexroth or Phoenix Contact and so on as well. And uh, this slide uh, from Smart Factory shows very well how the production has changed. So yesterday, uh, production is more or less cost-driven. So, um, and uh, of course we face increasing salaries. We had with this kind of production where we had relatively long delivery times and we have a long product life cycle. So products have been used much, much uh, longer than now. If you are looking on today, so the products are not developed uh, so much cost driven, it's, may, it's much more uh, customer driven and uh, the product individualization is what we see with, with Industry 4.0 that we can easy and flexible change the production process. We have shorter development times, shorter production time, shorter product life cycle in many cases as well. But uh, uh, at the end uh, we can make it faster, we can make it better and we can make it more cost efficient or more cheaper for the, for the customer. That's the advantage. So let's have a look on the project with Smart Factory we are contributing to. It's a production system for, for electronic keys, a key finder uh, machine which uh, with, a, with a robot, a SCARA robot to, for pick and place and, and, and some uh, units in the production process. And um, in this production process there are cyber physical systems, there are OPC UA components, there are uh, the product has a memory you, uh, realized with RFID that, so that the product itself or the part itself can, can tell the production process what should be the result. So in our contribution in that system is that we make the RFID data uh, tempo proof in the way that we digitally sign the data that is stored in the RFID tag. Furthermore, we do the do a secure key storage uh, for the certificates and the private keys for OPC UA, which is used for communication between the uh, components. And um, so with that security components from our side, we go from the sensor to the cloud. So in the cloud, there's another, uh, another system also using OPC UA and um, uh, solutions from us are used uh, to handle the secure keys in that in that machine, in that production system. So that's one project. Another project I want to mention is called Secure Plug and Work. And Plug and Work that uh, uh, you think on plug and play with USB and that's the idea behind it. 
that you can really replace uh, production components in a machine, in a production system, similar like connecting your USB devices to your smartphone, to your, to your notebook or to your computer, so that the device itself tells its uh, abilities and everything and it's configured automatically in the right way. That's the idea. And of course, to realize a secure plug and work, not only a plug and work, but also to make that secure, you need a secure authentication and configuration of the production components. You need a trusted communication. And here is where the Webu Systems contribution is. So we provide the code matter protection, the licensing, the security, and the OPC UA integration with the secure storage for the OPC UA credentials in that project. And the, the project also has uh, many members like Fraunhofer IOSB that is uh, organizing and managing the projects, but also companies like Schunk uh, that are producing and developing the grippers for robots uh, and maybe other things as well. And uh, um, some other companies uh, in the doing machines as well as some more research institutes like KIT, for example, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And a large project, the large one I want to want to mention is the reference project Security in Industry 4.0, UNO, called UNO, and that started in uh, July of last year. And it's mainly driven by four big use cases. Um, one of it is about uh, secure processes in individualized production, and that will be uh, implemented in a company called HOMAC. They are producing uh, machines for wood processing, so they can produce out of more or less, uh, you, you, on the one side you put in the trees, on the other side uh, you, get, uh, you get out uh, packaged uh, parts for furniture, for example. So um, the second use case is uh, a technology marketplace for process data. So the application is uh, secure the data. Technology marketplace for process data means that for example, the settings for a machine to laser cut a specific material with a specific uh, uh, thickness. Uh, there's a lot of experience and this data is valuable and so uh, creating a technology marketplace for that, you have many, many uh, contributing companies that don't want to give everything completely for free, that want to keep control uh, over their uh, technology data and to make a marketplace and database for that. That's the second application that's mainly driven by Trumpf. Um, a third use case, secure services, uh, remote access uh, with trusted partners uh, in a factory with many, many involved parties. So that's mainly driven by, uh, by Bosch. And the fourth uh, use case or testbed is uh, secure connectivity with a visual security control room, and that is driven by VW in a uh, car factory and will be installed in a car factory at VW in Germany at the end. So that's the four big use cases, and uh, of course uh, the results should not only be used in that for companies that are driving these use cases, but uh, the idea is uh, that at the end there is a uh, the outcome is something like toolbox that can be really transferred to the industry easily and can be used in many, many applications. But the idea why the German ministry um, made that, pro that large project uh, or funded partly this large project is that uh, we are not only developing something that is demonstrated, but uh, the idea is really to implement it in the factories of the four main driving companies, and that is Bosch, Trumpf, Homark and Bosch, um, um, and what's the last one? Uh, VW, of course. Yeah, you see, it's in total, it's 14 companies and seven seven research institutes that are working in that uh, national IT national reference project, security in industry 4.0. Yeah. Okay, that's the three sample projects. So let me come. Um, to my last uh, topic, how to implement security in connected products. So what are the requirements? Uh, if we are getting to flexible products and more and more software realized function, it's important to protect the IP, to protect the know-how. Uh, also, we need to protect the products against counterfeiting. Uh, that can be done 
both can be done by encryption, the IP protection and the copy and the, the counterfeit protection. And of course, the keys need to be stored in an unclonable way. We need to have a flexible licensing, and that needs that is also done. Software realized functions will be protected and encrypted differently, and then. Uh, the licensing needs to be integrated in the business process, so it needs to be implemented in an e-commerce platform, in an ERP system, CIM system, or however that this can be really done in an efficient way that you can realize new business models and new monetization strategies for your devices. So not only having a one-time sale of your product, for example an infusion pump for, for hospitals, but to create uh, business models for recurring revenues, selling the device once, but also creating revenues every year with the use. And a last very important point, and I think Richard mentioned that when he shows that medic, uh, when he when he explains the medical example, tempo protection is very important. That you really make sure that the data is not manipulated, that it comes from the right device or from the right person, and this is done using asymmetric cryptography and digital signatures. And the requirements for these industrial applications is really a high level of security, um, because uh, the attacker is not, um, is not the user itself, it's somebody from the outside. It might be the competition, it might be uh, national secret services, it might be terrorism or organized crime. So really here a high level of security is, is, is a must, is mandatory, and that requires some kind of secure element, uh, probably something like a small component that can be analyzed, certified uh, for itself, and then it can be integrated in a larger machine, in a larger device, in a larger product without the need of certifying and evaluating on this from the security standpoint the whole big product, the whole big machine. And that's very important and secure elements uh, came into place here at this point of time. Like uh, your smart card chip that is integrated in your passport or um, in your company uh, company card, something like that. Flexible storage to, to realize uh, applications like a technology data marketplace, of course, must be able to handle licenses from different uh, stakeholders, so licenses from different vendors. Uh, communication security, very important point. One possible solution is using OPC UA, for example. And retrofitting is also something that is important for smart factories and for industrial applications. Because the machines in our production facilities today they are used for a very long time, maybe tw some 20 years. And some of the very old systems, uh, we might be not able to integrate them very well in a smart factory today. But the, the medium age systems, uh, they should, we should be able to upgrade them so that they can really uh, be used in the new, with the new requirements in smart factories. So retrofitting in the brownfield on the install base is an important point for the security. And this is what Vivo Systems is offering. The heart of our technology is to store the cryptographic keys for uh, either communication or for enabling and configuration of features. And this storage is done in most cases in a secure element that like the code meter dongles for USB or the cards, SSD card, CF, CFast card that combines industrial flash memory together with this uh, uh, secure element, and uh, inside of this secure element, uh, the keys are stored and the DNA encryption, symmetric, asymmetric, took place, as well as the handling of uh, flexible license models. And one option is, one additional option is to store this information in an encrypted and digitally signed file and bind that to a secure element that is already existing in a system. For example, we demonstrated uh, last week at RSA conference in San Francisco in the TCG demo. Uh, we demonstrated how to bind licenses uh, to a trusted platform module, a TPM chip that is embedded in many embedded systems or PC-based systems. So that is what I mean if I talk about uh, binding uh, the license to a secure element that is already in a system. And so that is the heart of our technology. What we are offering additional to that are the tools for device manufacturer, for engineering companies to integrate the protection into their software, into their data. And we are offering the tools for the back office integration so that the license deployment and the key and certificate deployment can be easily integrated into the business process. 
and that is what uh, device manufacturer has to do. So one side, one time he has to integrate the protection into his software or into his data, so he can do that using our protection suite. Also he has to integrate the license creation and the deployment and the key deployment into his business processes and therefore we have a product called Code Metal License Central that can be connected to the ERP or CIM system, to an e-commerce platform, to a license portal for the customers itself, to, to have something like a self-service portal for, for the customers and then the software can automatically get the license information from that. So this process integration and product integration needs to be done once and then later of course the delivery is done to the user as often as possible many many times in a fully automated process. Uh, and some samples where you can find our solutions today uh, also in many different industries uh, the left sample is an ATM machine from Winkor Nixdorf that is uh, where the protection is inside to protect against tampering and also the service technicians and bank staff is using a, a kind of secure USB authentication device from us um, to do maintenance or to exchange the money box of the ATM. Another application is in the, in the area of game machines where you have high security requirements, the configuration of the machine, so the relationship between uh, paid um, paid money into the machine and uh, then the wins that are paid by the machine to the user must be, must be correct and not manipulated by somebody. Other applications are in the automotive area, so in the automotive is, uh, is an area where a lot of security is required if you think to the new applications like car-to-car -car communication and so on, but even not going so far if you are only going to the normal repair and maintenance uh, in the repair stations. Our technology is integrated in Acetronic, that's a car diagnostic software that is used in repair stations from Bosch and uh, with a special subscription based licensing model uh, the licenses for the software used in the repair stations is automatically renewed um, depending on the, on the maintenance contract. Other application in the medical area you see that Sirona sample that's at a dentist and it's to produce ceramic uh, fillings for T's um, in an easy way and here the security component is used to protect the machine against tampering uh, to make sure that it's really later used in the way it has been approved by FDA or German Medizin Gesetz, as well to realize new business models selling the machine at a lower price to the dentist but then charging him for each um, ceramic uh, filling he produced for, for the patient. And our other applications are in industrial automation, so that's close to smart factories, like in development tools and control equipment from Rockwell Automation or in Codices or Bernicke and Reiner, to mention two mid-sized uh, European companies. And one application we have shown also at IRC meetings is uh, security in a, uh, endpoint security in a railway control system, so for the power uh, converting system in the train, and that is based on or inside this power control system in the train is a uh, Vivo Systems uh, code meter uh, secure element, code meter, code meter stick, based on an, a smart card chip from Infineon. And so we have shown this sample at uh, an IIC meeting uh, together with Infineon in the US in the um, beginning of this year, I think. So let's come to a summary before answering the questions, so I would like to hand over to Richard to maybe uh, summarize the most important uh, things from his point of view. Thank you Oliver. I, I think the, uh, I, the, the most important thing to understand is that the technology is not particularly new. Um, we, we've seen Internet of Things for a long time. The Internet has, has been around at least for 20 years, 25 years, and it's based on lots of network technology comes, that came before, like ARPANET and JNET and so forth. But what's really happened is a convergence of economic and technical factors, including the availability of connectivity everywhere, the low cost of computation, the ability to lease com computational um, with things like the IBM, Amazon, Salesforce, or Google Clouds. So while the industrial internet is, is heavily hyped, I think different from most, most hyped technologies, it is something that actually has worked. It is working today. I know a, a, 
a, um, a dairy farmer in, in the northwestern part of, uh, of Costa Rica who turns out 40% more milk from the same cows on the same terrain simply by tracking those cows and, and keeping track uh, predictably of what, what kind of food they should be fed and how much milk should be taken from them each day. Um, this is not just hype. Although it is hyped, it is not just hype. There are real proven solutions today, and Oliver has been talking about some of the technology that makes that possible. Waiting for standards, I know there are a lot of organizations that are hoping that standards will solve the privacy, security, and interoperability issues and waiting to see that those come about, but the reality is on something like the Internet, there are always multiple solutions, and there are going to be multiple middleware solutions, multiple semantic solutions, and multiple technologies for getting there. So it makes sense to try to apply the technology now, figure out how this technology disrupts your business, your, your services, your products, because it's going to be disrupted by someone. You might as well do it yourself and understand what the future looks like by, by inventing it yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, uh, um, that's a very good uh, summary. And let me add uh, three points. So what I always say is that uh, if people ask me what's necessary, it's security, security, and security. Security is not everything. All the other processes around must be uh, carefully uh, designed and uh, established. But without security, it will not work. So security is the enabler for the IIoT and industrial internet. And uh, it needs to be in every network device. Every network device needs a temper-proof identity. And with the changes in smart factories, uh, IP and know-how, um, there will be more IP and know-how in the flexible production process because it's not optimized for one single task. It's uh, really flexible. And so this data is very valuable and need to be protected. So that's um, so far from my side. So thank you very much for listening to our webinar. I think we should uh, give back uh, the voice to Daniela to see what questions uh, we have received. Yeah. So while you were illustrating all this very interesting topics, uh, we have already collected a number of questions. So I'll start with you, Oliver. Uh, why is Vibu Systems engaged in so many different organizations? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, these organizations are not in competition. I think these organizations are complementing each other. So, for example, if I see that uh, why we are a member in OPC Foundation, it's because we want to have a... a um, very early knowledge of all the new standards. We want to be able to adopt and integrate the technology. Why are we a member in IIC? Of course, we are interested in the test beds. Of course, we are interested to learn more about requirements from different uh, industries. And as Richard all already told, uh, we must not wait for for standards for every little piece uh, of of uh, task we need to solve. We need to to start, and we need to evaluate and uh, uh, then um, make sure that we have an interoperable solution. And to do that, you need to understand the requirements from different industries, from different eras, and that's only possible in participating in different organizations. So we continue with another question for you, Richard. Uh, what is the exact purpose of TASPAS and how are the several different disciplines linked together? That's a good question. Uh, that's a good two questions. So the, the first one is, is easy. Um, we don't actually know what works, what use cases are going to work and what doesn't work. I, I actually believe in learning from failure, which is a, a necessary ingredient of success. So let's try it. Let's find out what products and services are going to come from applying Internet of Things technology to real-world situations in mining and manufacturing and healthcare apparatus integration and so forth. So that's why we're doing that. Um, and we, it, we're also figuring out by doing that which partners provide the technology, who provides the business model, how do we change the, the processes, the business processes based on the, the, the way this technology allows us to link things the way we've never linked them before. Um, I, I think that's critically important, and, and secondarily, we get from those test beds requirements and priorities for new standards. 
We think that standards, for example, DDS from OMG or OPC UA from OPC are critically important because they're already in use in millions, or in, in the case of DDS, billions of devices. So obviously it's important, and I think Oliver's point of participating in OPC, uh, OPC Foundation is, is, is uh, very important because you find that on every factory floor uh, in the world. Um, but we also know that we're going to need things above that, semantic standards for integrating systems, not just for moving information around. And uh, that's why it makes sense to try with these test beds to, uh, to find ways to connect systems and how that's going to change the way things work. We've already discovered some interesting changes in, the, in our test beds. For example, the Smart Cities test bed in Southern Ireland. We've discovered things by connecting national health resources with uh, provincial, or in the case of Ireland, they're called county ambulance services. We found things about, uh, about the way ambulances work that nobody knew. Uh, simply by doing real-time predictive analytics uh, on the information that's collected uh, in ambulances and healthcare data um, in, in Southern Ireland. The second question, I'm sorry, I've lost it. <laughs> How do you see all these different uh, uh, disciplines uh, linked together? Ah, uh, great example. And, and that one is a harder question, and the answer is we don't know, and that's why we do test beds. <laughs> Um, the, the reality is um, there, there will be opportunities where, for example, there, again in Ireland where we've linked up government resources with healthcare resources and traffic information so that the ambulance gets to the, the affected home or, or office quickly and gets to the uh, hospital the fastest way possible. There will always be opportunities, cross-disciplinary opportunities, and the only way we're going to figure out what they are is by building them and see what happens. So the next question applies to both of you. Uh, that someone who is interested uh, in uh, case studies or test pads in the chemical process industries, uh, do you have anything, uh, is there any information where we can redirect our listeners? What an excellent question. So as it happens, none of the uh, IIC test beds today are in the um, chemical, specialty chemical, or even con in general continuous process area. Um, but in fact, several of them are in the discrete process area. And um, I literally just last past Friday, I was in the offices of uh, one of the world's largest specialty chemicals companies, which plans to join um, and, and be the first um, specialty chemicals company to join, specifically to build test beds in the, in the chemical process area and, and learn um, how that technology is going to be disrupting the chemical uh, marketplace, not only from the perspective of chemical process chemical manufacturing, in other words, continuous manufacturing, but also how it's going to uh, disrupt the way that they deal with their customers and suppliers, in other words, how it's going to disrupt their supply chain, and where that's going to move the margins in the value chain from their suppliers to them to their customers. So um, the answer is there's nowhere I can point you to people who have been doing the, those sorts of projects already, but uh, there will be in the next few months. So, so back to, yeah. To address the question to both you. of us. Yeah, go ahead. And, uh, I can answer it uh, very similar to, uh, to Richard. So um, we are in projects where process uh, companies are included uh, already, but it's at a starting point. And indirectly, of course, the automation and control equipment like the PLCs uh, from Rockwell Automation are, um, are very much used in the process industry. So again for you, Oliver, now, we have touched uh, a few times on standards, interoperability, and propriety solutions during this discussion. But and all three seems to be different ways to approach the IoT technology. How is VB Systems specifically coping with uh, all three aspects and harmonizing them if possible at all? Yeah, with CodeMate or with our uh, product and solution for protection, licensing and security, uh, first we have a proprietary solution. But uh, wherever possible, we try to connect to interoperable standards. And that's what we did, for example, with the OPC UA. When integrating CodeMeter in uh, OPC UA client and server stacks, so we used the proprietary technology to store the cryptographic keys in secure elements in a secure way. But on the uh, way where such devices are integrated in a system, it's fully 
compliant to the open uh, standard and it's not a proprietary solution anymore. So that makes sure that systems from different makers uh, can work interoperable together. Even if some of them are using uh, another technology or storing the certificate only in a file on a, on a, on a system um, and other devices have the security with a secure element in a temperature sensor or fluid sensor or something else, they can work together interoperable. So whenever possible, we want to support existing standards like OPC UA or like adding, binding our technology to a trusted platform module uh, according to the TCG standards. Whenever possible, we try to do that. So one last question for you, Richard. Uh, you have mentioned this outstanding announcement that was made last week between IIC and the platform industry 4.0, but at the same time, uh, do you see any competition in the industrial internet world among the different initiatives that the various countries are sponsoring? So as it happens, we're the only one that is uh, developing test beds, so we don't really have competition. Uh, I think it's very important that we are looking to work with all of the national, uh, the nationally uh, focused and nationally funded, uh, and uh, regionally focused and regionally funded organizations as well. So of course there are many of those: um, the Made in India and uh, Internet Value Chain Initiative in Japan, and the Internet Plus Project in China, and the um, uh, AIOTI in the European Commission, and so forth. So. We have relationships with all of them. We do not intend to compete with any of them, uh, and we intend to share uh, most, if not all, of the information that we learn from building test beds. This is about disrupting the industry and learning what those disruptions are like. It's not about um, creating competition among countries. Or um, it's it really is bringing together companies that realize there's going to be disruption, planning that, planning and developing that disruption themselves, so they understand how their industries will change. Good. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Oliver, for this very interesting conversation, and a special thanks to all our attendees for joining us. Any last word from uh, the two of you? Thank you for taking the time, and, uh, and for going over time, in fact, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak from Vibu as well. Uh, thank you from my side as well, so enjoy your day or your, your evening, and uh, if there are any open questions uh, that uh, come up later, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much and have a good day.